<laughs> in Romans 15 and, and, and verse uh, 17, uh, let's see, let me get the right one here. I got the wrong one. Romans 15 and verse 19, that's it. Yeah. Through mighty signs and wonders, and by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all around, notice this phrase, I have fully preached the gospel. Thanks. Take your pen or pencil, if you do this in your mind, and underline the phrase, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Not every church fully preaches the gospel. I know some uh, intend to, some never intended to. And so I want to talk to you this morning what it means to be a spirit-filled church and a spirit-filled person. I want to redefine that for you because in our present condition, there are many who have assumed their full gospel, or assumed their spirit-filled, and really they're about half gospel, and they're not filled with nothing. Come on. And so we have to redefine this because terminologies and things now have been watered down to where you can't tell the difference between a non-spirit-filled Christian and a spirit-filled Christian. And there is a difference. Like there is a difference between a saved person and a non-saved person. If a person that's not saved, it's a major fact that they're not going to heaven. Well, that hurts my soul, and so won't help. Mm -hmm. I got yes. no amens on that. Yes. <laughs> because in the politically correct culture, I'm, I'm offended and hurt somebody's emotions. Well, I don't mind if I offend you today. You can just get over it, go home, and be mad. <laughs> so that's just the way I am. So you invited me, so you've got me for the next 30, 40 minutes, all right? But he said, I have fully preached the gospel. So we are part of a group of people that are called themselves full gospel. Now, there are different names by, by which people that believe what we call full gospel. So let me define that first. What does it mean to be full gospel? Number one, it means that everything that happened in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts still happens today. Amen. Yes. All right? That is the simplest way to define a spirit-filled full gospel, and I'll go through the names in a minute, what that means. That means everything we saw Jesus do, He still does it to you, for you, and through you. Yes. Amen? Everything we see in the book of Acts, every natural and supernatural happening of God and the people of God happens today. None of it has been done away with. It is all still active and present for them to have it in your lives today. Amen. Now, with that, we have to define differences. Not because we're trying to put anybody down. I want to secure what you are so you don't feel inadequate or you can not answer questions appropriately or when you're made fun of, know how to place it where it came from. Thank you for the no amens on that. <laughs> All right. We have, when Christianity was born, give you a little history lesson. When Christianity was born, out from the upper room with the, with the 120, then the 3,000, and the apostles and other church, early church group went all over the known world bringing the gospel. In the upper room, they, they received the Holy Spirit, which we'll look at in just a moment, with the evidence of speaking with tongues. And they went everywhere preaching the full gospel, that Jesus Christ is the Savior, He's the baptizer of the Holy Spirit, He's the healer, the soon coming King, and two other things, but begin to preach that. And God confirmed the gospel with three, three, three things. Signs, wonders, and miracles. That's right. So that's the way God still wants to confirm His word here, yes. and He places us to go through signs, wonders, and miracles. Amen. And then about 400 years after St. John died, that was the last apostle, St. John was the youngest of all the twelve, and he died in his 90s, as history tells us, after he got off of the Isle of Patmos. You all know what Patmos was. That was their prison island, or a hard work island. He got off the island because a new governor came into power and wanted to have all the citizens kind of like him. So he released a lot of the prisoners off the island, and John was one of them. So in the latter part of St. John's life, can you imagine going to an early church meeting, and there sits the last living apostle of the Lamb? I would not preach. I would put him in a chair and let him glow. Or do what he wanted to do. I mean, think of how difficult it may be that you go to a Christian meeting and there's Mother Mary, or there's Peter, or there's Matthew, or there's the little boy that just raised from the dead. I was raised from the dead by all those people were running around telling their story. Come on. See, that's the way the early church was. And so they heard the message and saw the miracles that God confirmed it. And about 40 years after St. John died, for some stupid reason, the people of that time changed the message. 
And it changed from God so loved the world to God's going to get you. Yeah. And it changed from God's forgiveness to God's judgment. Mm -hmm. It changed from heaven is our home to you're going to burn in hell. Yeah. And all of a sudden the whole thing flipped from a kind, loving, compassionate, healing God to an angry ogre that's going to get you, kill you, and beat you. Mm -hmm. All right? And so every once in a while, a little priest would jump up and go, I think there's a problem, because he actually would read the Bible. And when they read the Bible, compared to what they were doing in time, they would go, hang, and they would kill them. That's where some of the, there's two kinds of martyrs in the church history. The ones that sinners killed, and then the ones that church people killed. Yeah. And, and, and it's true, I'm not being rude, it's yeah. true. Amen. Now, we would do it today, but since we have human rights, we just do it through Gossip and internet slander. Just as bad. Same thing that goes on. The spirit that made actual killings are doing today this way. And so you have that. And so all of a sudden, Martin Luther, the great German reformer in the 1500s, broke the back of that religious demon that controlled the church world for over a thousand years. For a thousand years, they were told, God's going to get you. And you get kicked out of God's grace and you'll burn in hell if you don't come and give your money and show and the poor little girl. And they did it. So why did they do it? Because one, they didn't have a Bible. You have to realize for over a thousand years, Bibles and any kind of book was precious. There was no printing press until the middle 1500s. And so you, you, you had that problem. And so a lot of the folks knew there was a problem. They didn't have any way to stand on scripture or stand on something to say, hey, because even when the, the Bible was read in most churches at that time, it was read in the dead language of Latin. Yeah. So let me explain that. So when they would read what I just read to you, they would read it in a dead language and nobody else speaks it. Wow. So how religious and demonic that was to every time the scriptures were read, yes. the people didn't even hear it Amen. Wow. in their own language. Wow. It was read in a dead language. Wow. language of Latin. Wow. So by the time the teach church history, you'll be, you man, know, oh man. be interesting. And so you come through it at the Reformation. From that point on, restoration began to happen to the Christian church. Finally, Martin Luther came that you're saved by faith and grace. By faith are you saved. The just live by faith. And whack that thing in the face. And people begin to read the Bible, begin to hear good sermons, begin to believe and be born again. And restoration of the New Testament gospel was happening. Yes. And so we roll through history. John Wesley. you got all the others. And you come to the time when you have what you call the evangelical faith, what we call Protestants and, and, and Catholics. And then Protestants begin to divide over revelational restorations. So... Every denomination, if you go back in their history, they were birthed by a revival of certain truths that had been forgotten. But then they forget to, they forgot to keep moving, so they died in the thing that brought them alive. Does that make sense? Yes. And so you come over to the time when the Holy Spirit is being restored. Now, the Holy Spirit was working in bits and pieces throughout history. But in the early 1900s in Los Angeles, there came a restoration called the Azusa Street Revival where the Holy Spirit was speaking in tongues and the gifts of the Spirit was restored and remain, and it is still going today. We are still echoing from the revival of the 1900s of the full gospel. So that began a split between the evangelicals and what we call the Pentecostals. Everybody still with me? Oh, yes. All right? And so the split came because evangelicals and Pentecostals believe the same thing about salvation. They pretty much believe the same thing about the written Bible, the virgin birth. We believe all the same thing up until we get to the Holy Ghost. And when we get to the Holy Ghost, we go, that's what we believe. And they go, uh-uh. And they pull back and there comes a separation from the Baptists, the Lutherans, the Methodists, the Episcopal, all those great people do not believe the living work of the Holy Spirit today. So because we and our forefathers have embraced that everybody can be spirit-filled with the evidence of that infilling with speaking in tongues and walk in the power of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. We were given the left foot, left foot, left foot of fellowship. 
and pushed aside as the crazy kid. That is how there's been a continuation of God's restoration and the reaction to it. Now, some of you in this room probably came from different groups from before you became full gospel or spirit filled. So some of the things I'm going to say to you about this event, you're going to be able to identify with. And so what is happening today in America is for some reason the spirit-filled life is being marginalized again. Yes. And that many that have believed and received the Holy Spirit have been pushed to the side or told them to quiet down or in this church we don't do this. And then my question is, why are you in that church? Yes. We'll get to that in a minute. I don't know why you that know something and have tasted of something can go in a place that does not know it or does not want it and sit there and put your money there and take your kids there. When those kids get grown, they're going to be a hellcats to you. Come on. Good evening and good morning, everybody. Hello. And so that's why I read this verse, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And so we called ourselves about time. First, we were called Pentecostal because we Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4, the day of Pentecostal, we are the Pentecostals. And do you realize, if the statistic is still true, around the world, maybe not here in the state, but around the world, the tongue-talking people are the fastest growing group of Christian yes. Protestants in the world. Yes. But here in our country, it's going through a goofy moment. So I want to reaffirm some things to you Amen. Go ahead and, and help to strengthen the identity from Scripture and not just from cliques or rejectional groups. Yep. Are you with me? Yes. yes. And so... They called themselves full gospel. So after a while they got tired of the word Pentecostal. So we became full gospel. <laughs> that means we want the whole gospel. Amen. That's how they used to preach it. Yeah. And uh, you know, then we got into the charismatic movement. Yes. The charismatic movement is when the Holy Spirit went into the Methodist church and baptized with the Holy Ghost and they spoke in tongues. And some of them got the left foot of fellowship and told to leave. And they were called charismatics. They're more the refined historical churches, mainline churches that receive the Holy Spirit, and they call themselves charismatic. That's what that group is. And so there are different moves that have called themselves different things. We're probably the one group that has 15 titles. You know, I, I'm prophetic, I'm apostolic, I'm overcoming, I'm happy joy, whatever you want to call yourself. You know, we, we give ourselves new names all the time. But what it is in front of them is we believe the fullness of the gospel. Amen. Yes. That everything that happened in the gospel in the book of Acts still happens today. Yes. It has the potential and the desire to happen yes. to you and through you today. That's yes. what a spirit-filled, charismatic, Pentecostal, full gospel, prophetic, overcoming, apostolic, yes. whatever the name you want to put out there, that's what you mean. Hallelujah. Hey! Hey! Hallelujah. Like if you're a Baptist, you're a Baptist. You're not Baptist this, Baptist this, Baptist this, it's, it's your Baptist. If you're charismatic, if you're a tongue talker, you can be a Pentecostal, you can, it's a whole list. So, that's what I said about, what are you? I said, well, I just say, I'm a son of God, that's an easy way for someone to go figure that out. We're all, I'm a little bit more livelier than most assemblies, but at least doctrinally we're the same. So, I want to go through some points, and I won't get through all of them, on what it means to be spirit-filled. Uh, and have a spirit-filled life and to be a spirit-filled person. Is it all right with you today? Yes. Yes. Or are you going to take notes? Yes. Yes. Take notes and begin. Number one, a spirit-filled person first must be born again. Yes. A spirit-filled church believes that the way into the kingdom is through the new birth experience. Yes. And so there is no other way by which you come into the kingdom but through believing in Jesus Christ as a Savior of mankind who died on the cross and was buried in the tomb and God raised him three days later from the grave, and thus we have a resurrected Savior. We believe mm -hmm. that Jesus is the Son of God and the only name by which men and women can be saved. Amen. There is no plurality. A little bit of Buddha, a little bit of Muhammad, a little bit of Jesus. Oh, that takes you to hell that don't get you saved. <laughs> All right? So we want to reaffirm this in John 3, 1 through 7, we have the story where he says uh, to the, the, the priest um, Nicodemus that came, you must be born again. So Jesus said, it's in red letters, it kind of helps you recognize who said what in the scriptures there. You must be, that means there's no wiggle room, you must be born again. Yes. Alright? Now, most evangelicals and us will all agree on that point, that one bit of, uh, of, of division or discussion. You must be born again. And you're born again by believing and speaking, not by attending and giving. 
Come on now. Attending church and giving is a product of growing up in Christ. That's right. That's right. That's that is right. great. But you are born again by believing and speaking. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Amen. You believe wow. in your heart and you say with your mouth Amen. that God raised Jesus from the dead and you accept him. Yeah. You call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. Amen. Saved from what? From darkness, from hell, from judgment. Hallelujah. Yes. That's enough to get you saved. Amen? Amen? But you are saved and brought into the great family of God with all of its benefits and all of its pleasures and all of its rights. Amen? Amen. You must be born again, and it's a free gift of God. Yes. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, to make sure that no one has to pay for it with, with penance or cash or some type of, of self-sacrifice in a wrong way. You don't get saved. It's a free gift, so no man can boast. Thank you, Lord. It's a free gift. It's Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. Every day. You just unwrap the gift and take what God gave you called salvation. I can say it that way. Can you say amen? Amen. In Romans 8 and 16, it says that the spirit bears with us our spirit that we are the child of God or the sons and daughters of God. So one of the first works of the Holy Spirit is witnessing to you, or let me say the contemporary words, he confirms to you in language you understand that you've been accepted. Thank you, Lord. Now, some people can get that confirmation by just, amen, I did it. Others, they're moved on by other types of hearing God's voice or some other kind of thing. God speaks over, how many people in the world was it? Four or five billion? How many billion people in the world? Seven. Almost seven. Seven, seven billion. Right seven billion. Wow. He speaks seven billion languages. Yes. Mm -hmm. He speaks everybody's personal language. Yes, he does. He can speak your language to tell you that you've been accepted in his family and all is well. Come on. Amen. Come on. So I like that. Thank I like you, Lord. of the Spirit. Praise the Lord. Number two, if you're going to be a Spirit-filled church or a Spirit-filled person, we believe in water baptism. Amen. We believe that Christ was baptized by John the Baptist in water to signify his obedience. We also follow that. And we also believe it's not just a ritual, but something supernatural happens when you go under the waters of baptism. The old man gets washed away and you come up a brand new creature. Thank you, Lord. There's a work of the Spirit done in baptism. Matthew 3, verse 13 through 17. <laughs> and we can go through other scriptures to talk about it. But I hope that in your church and all the churches that we work with, that they will all be strong about water baptism. Amen? Sometimes we, we do something, we believe in it, but we don't have the excitement about it. And we've lost the revelation of it. And we're among many full gospel people. They believe in water baptism, but they've not quite kept the fire about it. So maybe you can get some fire about it again, and, and, and when the next time you do some water baptism, everybody shows up. I promise. Everybody's a part of it. Yep. Yeah. Everybody sings, and everybody gets involved in it, yep. because it's, a, it's also a public sign of your faith in Christ. Yes. Overseas, when I'm in these foreign countries, sometimes baptism carries so much more weight than it does in our culture. Because it is a true sign of your faith in Christ Jesus. When you go and be baptized and people can see it and behold it, that's the second great affirmation in their mind yes. that you are a true Christian. Amen. Yes. Yes. Amen? Yes. Amen. Yes. yes. Praise the Lord. Am I still happy? Yes. Are you all still saved now? Yes. Okay. yes. Hey, how many have been more baptized? All right. If you haven't, talk to pastor afterwards yes. and, and we'll find you a, a pool, an ocean, which we're over there, and we can... We can Hakka Bahaya, Hoka Bahul. I'm going to take care of you, all right? We can have a good time. I, I like it. I had one of the best baptism services I ever did in my life was in the nation of Oman on the Persian Gulf. Mm. Muscat, Oman. I've been to 127 countries of the world, and, and it's great to see how everybody loves the Lord and sometimes in different ways in how we express it. And um, so we've got people. You know, I was there for two weeks and preaching at homes and things, and there were people that got saved or had been saved that never were baptized. And I thought, well, let's just baptize them. Well, I didn't know it was against the law and, and because it's a Muslim country. And so it's a Muslim nation. So Christianity only has two churches in that country outside of the capital with barbed wire around it. There's a Catholic church and there's a Protestant church. And if no actual uh, uh, person from Oman can go to those things. Only foreigners can go there. And uh, so others, there's underground churches everywhere. You know that. There's some in China, and there's a lot in the Middle East, too. And uh, so they just, I said, well, let's just trust God and do it. I said, I'll do it the last night. If they get mad, I'm gone the next day, so they don't have to worry about it. I'm still in town. Because <laughs> if I'm the, the, the point, they can blame me because I'm leaving, then I'm, they can...
hope they get the heat off of themselves. And so we had this one apartment that had a pool in the middle, and it was like a round building that went up. And so they said, well, let's go there uh, on this day because it's the heart of anybody's home, and da-da-da-da. I said, okay. So I thought it would be kind of a quiet little baptism <laughs> service, but not one Pentecostal could ever be quiet. They Hallelujah. Know, not in our blood. We are the loud children in the body of Christ. Yes, yes. You know, you'll have two or three kids. There's a studious child, a mischievous child, and then there's a loud child. <laughs> well, the Pentecostals are God's loud children. Yes. So if they don't like it, we're just loud. That's what we are. Thank we're, you, we're loud on the day of Pentecost, and every place we go, we're loud. And so I thought we'd try to be Baptist that day and be quiet. But they wanted to be Pentecostal. And they brought their guitars. And I thought, oh, Lord, we're going to sing. <laughs> so I thought it was going to be like a quiet baptism. It's like take 10 minutes and baptize, you know, was it four or five of them. And uh, Lord, no, the families came, the kids came, the dog came, everybody came. I thought, we're making a scene. <laughs> well, Lord. And if we're going to do it, you're going to have to take care of us. Yes. So we start baptizing. So each one, that, you know, they wanted to testify. I thought, we'll do it in like 30 seconds. <laughs> well, that's the other problem with Pentecostal. We go on forever. And so they start preaching and shouting and doing that. Uh, we're going to jail. And I'm going to be in lots of trouble. And so the first push them under the sun. They all, yeah, and they scream and yell. And all of a sudden, my nose, I got about the third one, I looked up, and the Muslim people begin to come out of their houses, oh, and they were clapping too. I thought, oh. <laughs> so maybe this is one of those wild signs of wonders happening. Hallelujah! All of a sudden, I thought, well, they're all here. We might as well go ahead and do some preaching. Uh, people want to take advantage of it. They're all in one place. And so they like the music when they go into the world. I don't know if they understood or not, but then I started preaching. I thought, well, they're here today. Because they believe in Jesus. And I, no, 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 gave a sermon on each one baptized. No, they clap and do all that stuff. And they made a great deal about that. was important to them. Their yes. water yes. baptism yes. was almost as important or equal in their hearts yes. to their confession of faith yes. when they got saved originally. Mm -hmm. That they were able to express through baptism that I believe in Christ and follow in his example that way. Amen. So we, we don't want to ever make fun or forget that important part of our Christian life and our Amen. witness. Amen. Now, we always get this. Let me answer why I'm here. Well, I was sprinkled as a baby. Should I get water baptized? Yes. Yes. Probably yes. 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 I think yes. baptism should be something that you are aware of what it means. Yes. 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 And as soon as a person is aware of what, even if, it's a child, if a child understands what it means to be saved, they can be saved. It comes to their understanding. So, not that I don't appreciate the blessing they gave you when you were a baby, but you didn't get saved then. That's right. And I think you can go through water baptism, and it's my thought. You can do what you want. It's not going to send you to hell. It might make some Pentecostals mad, but it won't send you to hell. <laughs> All right? But if you were one of those baptisms where you were sprinkled on that stuff, but you, that was the more, I look at it as a blessing. Yeah. And not as conversion. Yeah. And I think you should be able to do it when you understand what's happening yeah. so you can have a full impact of it in your own soul. Yeah. That's yeah. my thought for you to discuss at lunchtime today. All right? Amen. Notice nobody said amen on that. Are you all sprinkled? No. <laughs> I mean, sprinkled. I mean, sprinkled my little one. Can we go with sprinkled? All right. Well, get re dipped. Yeah. If you haven't already. But, uh, you know, that's something for you and your pastor to talk about, but I'll, I'll initiate the conversation. How's that? I'll, Thank you. I'll stir it so everybody talks about it after I'm gone, all right? Number three, I mean, number three, to be a spirit-filled church or a spirit-filled person, we believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with tongues. Now, hold your place there, and I want us to go to Acts chapter 19, and I want us to look at something Paul did to affirm certain things to us today. And uh, Acts 19 this is how the Ephesus revival began. And it starts in verse 19, or chapter 19, verse 1. It came to pass that while Paulus was at Corinth, Paul, passing through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. And he found certain disciples. Now, verse 2. And Paul said to the disciples that he found, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And the disciples said to Paul, We have not so much heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And I want to kind of paraphrase it. And Paul was like, well, that's odd. Then what baptism were you baptized? And they said, John's baptism. Then he located where they were. He didn't disrespect where they were. He had to find out where they were. Because at first, like, well, you've been baptized. So he had to find out. 
And he preached to them these things. He said unto them, you were uh, then Paul verse 4 said, John barely baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that you should believe on him which should come after him, that is in Christ Jesus. When they heard these things and were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake in tongues and prophesied. All right? Now, notice in this passage, and there's more, but we're just going to highlight this one, that Paul asked a question. After they had believed, have you received? Notice he says, have you received the Holy Ghost since or after you believe? So he's making it a different experience than what happened at your new birth experience. Everybody with me? Yep. Well, something, when they got saved, they got baptized too. No, you got the witness of the Spirit. Right. And you got a degree of the work of the Spirit, but the infilling or the overflow of the Spirit did not happen. That is a second operation, as you can see here by Paul's question. Have you received the Holy Spirit since or after you believe? And then they received it, and verse 6, he said, they laid his hands on them, and the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues, and they also prophesied. Yes. When you go through the Bible, and you find where people receive the baptism or the infant of the Holy Spirit, there always comes with it an evidentiary sign of that occurrence in that person's life, and it is called speaking with other tongues. It is a language that God gives you supernaturally that does not come through your head. It comes out of your spirit, and your head normally goes, what in the world is that the first time it happens? <laughs> and maybe the first little while, you're like, you know, mental conflict, because it does not originate from here, it comes from here. Yeah. It took a while for my head to like my tongues, but I told it, we're going to do tongues, so you might as well just get used to it and go ahead and die. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> and one day my head said to me, I would leave you if I could. I said, if you can't, so you're stuck. Yeah. you got to talk to yourself a little bit. Speaking in tongues is a part of the New Testament life of the believer and the church. Right. Yes, it is. And so, in the early 1900s, there came a group of people that said yes to it and did not back off of it, and it remained a force in Christianity to this day. And so, a spirit-filled person, a spirit-filled church, embraces... The second work of the Spirit after salvation is the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with tongues and other signs of its dwelling. It's not the only one. Yeah. All right? Everybody still with me? Yes. All right, now let me just kind of uh, address this. For those of you who say, Paul didn't speak in tongues. Really? Because when he gives his testimony, Of receiving the Holy Spirit was speaking in tongues in those storylines. You read it, you go back to the book of Acts. So that's where some people go, well, he didn't speak in tongues. So let me give you a verse. This is going to this little issue for all the Paulites. And, and, uh, and go to 1 Corinthians 14. Everybody still with me? Yes. All right, it's quick right here. So I'll, 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 it's still ready, so I'm not done preaching. All right. In 1 Corinthians 14 and 4, Paul. Number one, write any other New Testament writer. For a guy who didn't receive the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues, he sure knew a lot about it. I believe he did, and here's why. Here's one reason why. Verse 18 says, Paul writes, I thank my God, I speak in tongues more than you all. So Paul affirms that he's a tongue talker. Right. All right? And he does it more than anybody else. So I want to get you on a holy competition this morning. Let Paul keep the title Chief of Sinners. Let him keep that title. But let's take this title away from him. We want to pray in tongues more than Paul did. Yes! Can we, yes, can Lord. we compete that way with Paul? Because I remember I was a little boy in the church. We have testimony meetings. We have tests. We have testimony meetings. And they get up and they I'm dirty rotten. And they tell all the crap that they did. They just go on forever. Like, can we get to the good part? Even as a kid, like, when's it going to change? I did this. I step around. I drunk. I you still are kind of crazy, but we love you. Yes. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm the chief of sinners. I'm with Paul. I probably outdid Paul. See, in my church, they try to outdo Paul the wrong way. They want to do outdo Paul. I was working. Have you killed anybody lately? That's it. That's Paul, it. Paul was a killer of Christians. And anybody yet so far in my life that has done that. So Paul keeps the title. Yes. Right. All right, so let him keep the chief of sinners titles. But let's compete with him on this part. Verse 8. I speak with tongues more than you all. 
So we won't know if we win until we get there. So just keep going for it 90 miles an hour. Amen. 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 So Love it. The benefits of praying in tongues. I don't have time to teach all of this because I just want to highlight it. Maybe I'll come back sometime and do a series for you on that. Because I want you to understand, speaking in tongues, that means I have the Holy Spirit and I'm going to speak in tongues once. Well, Ephesians talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit, me being filled, a continual influence. So there's a continual life of the Spirit. Paul talks here in this chapter, I taught it last night, verse 14, 14 and 15, that I will pray in the Spirit and I will pray in English. I will pray and sing the Spirit I will sing in English or your native tongue. And so he does both. So praying in the Spirit is to be a part of your devotional life, your time together as a church. And there are public tongues and interpretation that needs to be interpreted for understanding. But then there's private word of language that does not need a public interpretation. Now, God will sometimes help you understand what you're praying in tongues. Because there's private interpretation of your tongues. Or sometimes you just get the gist of it. Does that make yeah. sense? You kind of know what yeah. you're praying about, yeah. but you don't know all the details. And sometimes you don't because you don't need to know. Right. You think, why? <laughs> because you're probably doing intercession work on somebody or some case yes. that you just need to trust God and flow with. And when you get to heaven, you can solve somebody from a yes. wreck or save somebody's divorce or you know, whatever it might be. That You just have to be able to be an intercessor willing to go that route with it. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 So speaking in tongues is for the name. 1 Corinthians 14 and 39. Go over there real fast. It says, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. All right. The Bible says, covet to prophesy. That means we should value prophecy. Right. Yeah. We had some exhortation today from the church, from folks in the church. It's great to see that. And forbid not to speak with tongues. So I would encourage you, if you're visiting today, if you're listening to this CD after five years or after I'm dead, I still stand on this. You cannot go to a church that forbids speaking in tongues. If Come on. That part of the life of the Spirit. I really think it's a mistake that many of our friends are making. Yeah. Yeah. Now, there are other Spirit-filled churches, and every church has its flavor. It has its way of doing church. And you've got to find one that's right for you, but you've got to make sure you don't end up with one that is right for your flesh. Right. Or right for your rebellious kids instead of putting them in the right environment so they can learn and grow and be delivered. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Amen. So well. I cannot put somebody in speaking in tongues. You, now, it means you need to And let's just take it to a point. Because you're like, well, you can do it privately. You, well, I appreciate your permission what I can do in my private home. Wow, that's right. I want to go to a church that encourages people to speak with other tongues and the benefits of tongues. I want people that come to church and know about it, and if they want to receive that part of the work of God, to receive it in the altar in the prayer rooms of that church. I, I want to be in an environment where that can flow as the Spirit wants to work it, and we can enjoy it and not pray of it. And so, people say, well, the, the sinners will get upset. They're upset anyway. They're upset they've got to quit sleeping with their girlfriends. They're upset they're already upset. So I'll just add another thing to it. Come on. They're offended. That was it. Yeah, they're offended for the word's sake. So uh, I want to encourage you. Yeah. And encourage your friends to speak up. You don't have to be argumentative or hostile, but just speak up like you hear me today with people about and challenge them. Challenge them. Well, I don't like this new field church. Well, it doesn't do. Go over and have Yes. Go help them yes. build that kind of church. What's bugging you is part of what you're called to do. Wow. Yeah. All right, that went over really well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Amen. One more thought I would sow to you. There are two kinds of meetings we find in the New Testament. There are believers' meetings and there are outreach or evangelistic meetings. Amen. And there are two different functions. When you're going to go fishing, you go fishing. But when you're among believers' meetings, there are things you do as a family. And you do as a church from that you preach on things, you flow certain ways, you'll sing longer in tongues. There's things you will do in a believer's meeting that does not need to be obey an outreach protocol. Yes. Yes. Uh, and what we're trying to do today, we're going to churches who keep the protocol of outreach for their whole church. That's right. And they never have a time to be a believer's meeting. Uh, now, I grew up in the Word of Faith movement. Anybody want to know my Word of Faith movement? Brother Hagen, the teaching of faith yeah. revival. Now, we were strong on believers' meetings, and we were light on outreach. 
Okay? That was one of the weaknesses of that revival. But God was teaching us the word and growing our faith, and we had tons of great believers' meetings. But our outreach was not as healthy as it should have been. It was there, but not as strong as it should have been. Everybody understand what I'm saying? Yep. So God wants to fix that a little bit. Amen. But we don't throw out what we've gained to do what we were weak in. We keep doing that, and we add to this and strengthen it Amen. so we can do both. Amen? But I'm out. Plus, to be honest, with all these crazy pagans in Orlando, all these new age people. Hallelujah! <laughs> all the new age psychics and all the contemporary. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the it's almost like we're going back, if you know ancient Magic. history and ancient civilizations and ancient yeah. religions, it's like all the stuff's coming back in America. I'm like... Does yeah. anybody ever read history and know that that's what that is? And you know, our abortion thing is like those nations that killed babies in the past. Yeah. Right. And all this stuff yeah. is coming back around. Yeah. But we are the answer by Christ to yes. say no to yes. the evangelize yes. yes. the Spirit. Come on. So, but, but I'm from that some of the New Agers wow. <laughs> would like to hear you pray in tongues. That's right. Oh, yeah. That's right. So the Bible says that it's a sign to the unbeliever too. That's right. Yeah. So sometimes we need to like, you want to hear me pray in yeah, tongues? <laughs> and this, they go, yes, and this pray in tongues for them. Yeah. So what does it mean? Was it ask God, God, what's the interpretation of what I just prayed? He may give you the interpretation or the gist of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't want us to be ashamed of anything to do with the Holy Spirit and start with tongues. Right. Amen? Yeah. A spirit-filled person believes in speaking with tongues, and everybody should receive it. There's no such thing as, that's not my gift. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this Holy Spirit prayer language program is for every believer. Yeah. Right. There's nine gifts come of the now. Spirit. That's right. All nine are for you too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But the nine gifts of the Spirit come when you need certain yes. ones. Yes. Right. Yes. You, you may go for a while, you may not need eight of the gifts. Right. Better when you don't have them, that means you didn't need them. That's right. 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 But come when on. you need them, God will will them to come and bless you. Yeah. I like all nine. Because yeah. Yeah. I need my revelation gifts to help me understand. I need some discernment. I need some help. I need some power. I need some yeah. faith. Yeah. Come on. And then times I'm like, Amen. I have no more faith for anything. Do not give me any more faith projects or I will die. <laughs> Ever felt like that? Because your normal faith has a limit to because you've grown it all to a certain place. And sometimes... Your private challenge or your church challenge is like, I, I can't do this. Right. And you really can't. You come to your end of your faith. Yes. You haven't no. lost your faith. No. Your faith is used all you got and there's nothing more to do. Thank That's you. where the gift of faith comes. Thank you, yeah. Lord. Thank okay. you, Lord. And God sees you need a little boost, yeah. so he takes a portion of yeah. his faith yeah. and Bam. Supernaturally shoots it into your situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It happens immediately, or you have enough hallelujahs to make it to right, the end. Right. Yes. Glory. Yes. Glory. I'm not sure it's done instantly, but it doesn't always happen that way. That's right. But either way, I'll take it. Amen. Yeah. Am I helping anybody? Yes. Yeah. So thank God that all nine gifts are yours. That's right. Yeah. So learn about all of them because throughout your life, you're going to need all of them sometime. Right. Yes, sir. You'll all need the discerning spirits when you get married and you do business. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Please quit putting yeah. your money in goofy places and going broke and then getting mad at church and God. Yes. <laughs> Let the gifts of the Spirit help you discern the thing. Yes. Yeah, thank you. I remember one time I was, I used to live in Minneapolis. You ever been over in Minneapolis, Minnesota? Yeah. There's two seasons, winter and road construction. <laughs> because they have to fix the roads from all the salt and stuff during the winter. And, and it's, it was so cold. I lived in Oklahoma. I was born in Oklahoma, so I lived in Minnesota for five years when I first left home. Well, I've never been in so much cold. Everyone you went outside and you took a deep breath, your nose stuck together. And it freaked me out. I still remember that happening the first time. I got scared and ran back inside. I can't go out there. I'm going to die. So, sounds weird, but it's true. I didn't know you, it would freeze. It was like, what, 14 below zero? You don't take deep breaths in that kind of air. You take really light ones. Well, it all froze, so it freaked me out. And so I had saved, I had saved some money, and I was thought, I'm going to buy me a little small condo for me and my family and my relatives in the British uh, or in the Virgin Islands. I go down there and preach all the time. I thought, there's a nice little condo there that somebody wants to sell. And I was going to go buy it, and I had all the money. I was my, I saved my money. I wasn't using church money. I saved my money. So what I do with my money is my business. Right, right. I didn't take your money. I didn't take God's money. It was what I saved. See, a preacher can do what they want to do if it's their money. And they got it the right way. All right? Because make sure everybody knows it's 
your money, not the church money, so there's no trouble. And so I, I got the contract, I reviewed it, looked at it, did all the diligence you do when you buy something. I had the, actually, I had the check in my, in my briefcase to do the half of it, to pay half of it up front, so much I paid that same. And, uh, and I was going to sign it and hand him the check. I mean, I was already, I was, it was a done deal. And the Lord said, do not do this. I said, I yeah. told you. <laughs> and when you bind the Lord and, it's, uh, and it's in you, the Lord don't get bound. If it's a devil, it'll get bound. <laughs> so I thought, now you tell me. I'm here in the office with my pen. And for whatever reason, he just came at that moment. Or maybe I slowed down enough to hear. It's probably what the reality was. Yeah. Let me just confess, I probably slowed down enough before I signed. I thought, okay, I'm signing from green to this much. And I said, do not do this. It's a mistake. Mm -hmm. I said, I bind you. And then he said it again. He said, trouble, trouble. I heard trouble two times. Trouble, trouble. Well, that's all I thought. But how do I get out of this politely? <laughs> so I figured out, can I take this home and think about it? Over one more week, and then I'll let you know. Oh, sure. Good. No confrontation, person to person here. Because <laughs> I didn't want to hurt. They were good to me. They were good real estate. They were good. There was nothing bad at all. Nice. And I thought, well, Lord, what is it? And, and he never answered any more of that. He just said, trouble, trouble. I thought, I have enough of that already. I don't need more. So I didn't sign that. I went home, and I called him. I said, I don't want, I'll, I said, I will send a check to honor what work you've done. I don't want you to not make your, your thing because you worked hard for me. And I wanted to honor them. So I sent them a check, and, and they were happy about that. I said, I, I just can't do it. And I, I, I told them, I said, I feel like the Lord said no. And that's not toward you, it's just toward me. And they said, well, okay, we don't want the Lord upset. I said, no, we want to be alone. <laughs> so I don't know if they were Christian, or they were polite about it. And about four months later, a hurricane comes by and destroys that whole wow. thing. I was so glad. I was so happy that the gifts of the Spirit can come in and speak Thank to me. You Lord. me where I didn't have trouble Thank and you Lord. trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. See, what did the Lord tell other people? I don't know. I guess they're not listening or willing to listen. Everybody enjoying this? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. See, if you're not Spirit-filled, you don't get this. That's right. That's right. That's right. If you're not in a Spirit-filled church, you don't hear those kind of things because they don't happen over there. They don't believe it. They endure to the end. <laughs> well, I'm going to endure to the end with oh the gift of the Spirit, oh the voice of God, and walking with Him, yeah. victorious life, and overcoming the trials of life with the help of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit and the Word. Yeah. Now, you can endure, like, if I got cancer, I don't want a Baptist to pray for me. <laughs> because they're going to prepare me to die. Lord, help them. Get ready. Your will being done. I don't need somebody that already knows the will of God. Because we know what the will of God is with healing and sickness. Yes. God bless them. I'm not being mean to them. They're nice people. And they'll get you saved every Sunday for sure. Yep. They have a real good salvation ministry. And I value their salvation ministry. We can, we can learn from them in our full gospel how to do salvation ministry. And I mean, go after soul. They're, they are real good like that. But if you get sick, you're going to die. Right. You're not going to get healed over there unless it's an accident. <laughs> One of those sovereign things that God just does because He just doesn't. Yes. Yeah. You don't do that. Are you with me? Yes. I want somebody like you Hallelujah. that knows the will of God and lay hands on me and I'm the holy. I'm trying to close. You sang for an hour. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I got three minutes, all right? <laughs> So, everybody got the point of the Holy Spirit? Now, I, I don't want Praise you to receive God. my comments about the other <laughs> Christian groups as negative, but you need to know the difference. Yes. You can know the difference about being judgmental or have a superior elite attitude. I don't want us to be superior. I want us to be where we can live empowered life and through the Holy Spirit's example may cause them to consider what they have been resisting or what they've been told doesn't exist. Amen? Amen. A full gospel church, a believer, believes in healing and deliverance. Yes. Yes. We believe that Jesus, according to Exodus 15, I am the God that healeth thee, is still the God that healeth thee. Yes. Yes. Amen. 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 Now, sometimes people have a collision between medicine and divine healing. 
To me, there is no problem. God can use medicine, and he can use divine healing. I prefer divine healing because it's cheaper. And it comes without scalpels and needles. All right? Now, does it mean that you don't have faith and you need to go to the doctor? No. But here's how Brother Hagin said back in bar. Brother Hagin goes, many doctors kept you alive long enough not to need a doctor. <laughs> you know what he's saying? Yeah. Thank God for all the doctors that kept you alive so you could grow your faith where you don't need them anymore. Don't thank need you, them Lord. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think, thank God, Doc Luke was a doctor. Yeah. He wrote the book of Acts and the gospel of Luke. He was a medical doctor. If we had a problem with medical science in the ministry, there would not be two books of the New Testament written by a doctor. Right. Thank God Dr. Luke did write it because he put the details. Because doctors are detailed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why there's more details in what he wrote. Amen? Amen. So Paul even told Timothy, before there was Tums, <laughs> he said, take a little wine for your stomach's sake. Yeah. So Paul was giving <laughs> medical advice. Did y'all get that kind of slow, aren't you? Oh, <laughs> no, we had to ask it for that. <laughs> That's not a license. Go out and say, Pastor said, go get drunk. I didn't say that. <laughs> but Paul, you'll, find that in the, you'll find that in Paul's reading. He said, Timothy, take some wine for your stomach's sake. Yeah. Yeah. Well, to me, that's medical advice. That's how mom and dad or friends say, you know, you just do this, I'll take care of it. All that goes in there among the great miracles of healing. Amen. Yeah. So as full gospel spirit-filled people, I don't want us to be anti-medicine. But I don't want medicine to be the final statement. Yes. Yes. Let's let God be the final statement. Because yes. sometimes doctors, yes. they, they are good. They tell you what they can and cannot do. They tell you what they know about your situation. But don't let their statement be the final statement. Amen. Amen. Let the word of the Lord, the report of God be yes. your statement. That's right. Amen. Final statement Amen. over your situation. Amen. Yep. Amen. 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 I've had doctors Amen. help. And I've had places where I didn't need doctors. Thank you, Lord. There are things today I know how to get healed from by believing yes, yes. and receiving it from God. There are some things I'm not there yet, but I hope to be there before I'm dead. Right. Come on. I want to keep growing so I get there. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. I, I'll tell you a little story. Uh, I had back surgery about two years ago, almost a year, almost two years. I, had, I always, because I travel so much, I always go to chiropractic doctors to help keep my spine because you're on beds and planes and all kinds of things, so your body's all... So I've done this for years. So I have real good spine. Uh, but the bottom one got mad at me. The bottom little vertebrae. He got mad and popped out. Oh. And he hit up against a little nerve. Like a, a, oh, a little thing. I forgot what you call it. Huh? Well, it pops out. There's a little stuff between the vertebrae and the gooey stuff. Oh. That's it. Hurting it is. He got mad. And it popped out. It's only about that big. But it brought me to a standstill. Because it hit up against the nerve. Now I'm telling you. I prayed for the rapture quite often there now. Time like, Lord Jesus, can I die now and do the intercession work on the other side? Because yeah. I know when you're in pain, yeah. it's painful. Yeah. And so at first I thought, well, you know, we'll get it. They did the x-rays and that. Here's what it is. So you can see it. And I prayed. I thought, I don't have faith to, to walk this out just by believing and receiving. I need some medical help. So I go in. And it takes 30 minutes. It takes more to get prepped than it does to do the surgery. Mm -hmm. So I walk in all painful. And they drug me. Please, you don't need visions that way. <laughs> Amen. I appreciate what they were doing, but they, they give me a bottle of morphine. Now, morphine to me means about to die kind of pill. I, yeah. I know that's not true, but in my head, when I hear morphine, that's what they make you happy before you leave. Yeah. And I thought, <laughs> they're giving me morphine. Am I dying? I don't know. You know it's just my own, my own brain, okay? Right. And so they gave me 200. No wonder there's an epidemic in this country. Oh, 200 morphine pills. Thank God my mother was a nurse at one time and we're medically minded. I'm like, are you kidding me? You only need like maybe one or two a day at the most. And you're in orbit. You're in high heaven. <laughs> but you can't believe one thing you're seeing because it's not from Jesus. It's, it's from other stuff. <laughs> you feel ready to go Amen. take on the whole world. Yeah. That, that pill wears off and then you're back, oh my God, kill me. And uh, so I was going through all this. I go into the... Into, it was a walk-in, walk-out kind of surgery. I walked in, helped in, and I walked out three hours later with no pain. It was wonderful. That like, crazy God. Amen. And so I went for a few months, and um, and everything was great. And then one where I woke up, and it came back. I thought, oh, my Lord, what did I do? Because like, you can't pick up things. I was being very careful. I didn't even travel. I stayed home. Uh, because when you're on the road by yourself, you've got to pick up your suitcase. And you, you just can't do this. You don't know what happened. So I had to obey the orders of the physical. And I was happy to do that. And I went back to the doctor, another x-ray. 
Well, it's come back. I said, why? Well, 15% of all these come back, and you must be one of 15%. Oh. I don't mind you. Yeah. Oh, I do a lot of that one I admit. I bind you and everything you just said. Right. I don't want to go back under that knife again. And, and, and it wasn't tragic, but I just don't like you. I don't want to do it again. Right. I said, well, okay. I said, what do I do? What, 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 what do you, what, what? Well, we can go back in and fuse it. I thought, what's a fusion? <laughs> well, you don't want to know what a fusion is. I thought they'd been there and clean it up again. No, they want to put steel bars and screws. Yeah. And, I thought, no, 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 no. They brought that thing out and put it on the table. I thought, that, no. They yeah, no. said, so, Mr. Laird, you, you're going to need that. I said, I said, no. What's number two? And they said, well, you can go have shots and do all that, but you'll eventually come to this. There's some more more. Wow. Yes, some more more. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, and I said, well, I can do the, the shots and help, you know, the epidurals, you know, ladies, you know what you're doing. Ooh. Well, for a guy, we've never seen any of that big come toward us. <laughs> and so, so I said, well, I, I can do that. I can go take that and maybe it'll heal or do whatever it is. I said, I'll do that. And, uh, and then I was taking some other herbal things just that it might help to, you know, how you do a little bit of everything. And so I'm in, I'm in 7.30 in the morning. Me and my mom, she drove me in to get the epidural. So I'm in the little gown with no clothes on, which is very uncomfortable. Everybody's walking in, you're naked under a sheet. So it's like, praise the Lord. And so they're going to knock you out and flip you over and do the whole thing. And so I'm sitting there and I heard myself say, we're not going to do this today. I just heard myself say it out loud. And I said to myself, no, Roberts. You're going to do this. You're butt naked behind this sheet. You've already got the IV. You're ready. You're ready to go. You're not scared of needles and stuff. You give yourself vitamin B shots. So I was talking to myself, and the nurse came in. Well, what do you mean, Mr. I said, uh, we're not going to do this today. Thank you. And I said, yes, we are. And I, and I heard myself say again, thank you for what you've done, but I need to let you know in the doctor, it's, we're not going to do this today. And my brain goes, are you crazy? I go, yes, I'm crazy. There's something wrong with this picture. And then the doctor came in, and he was a brain surgeon that had gone into the pain management world. And, and uh, he said, doctor, he said, Mr. Lynn, I understand you don't want to do this. Are you afraid? I said, not really, but we're not going to do this. I kept we hearing are. myself say that. And inside I'm going, yes, you are. Yes, you are. I'm yes. agreeing with the doctor. I'm agreeing with the nurse. And then I realized my spirit was talking above my natural Praise position. God. When I finally woke up to the fact that this was not just me being weird, but actually in this case for me, that it was the Lord, the Spirit, and we're not going to do this. Yes. And when I finally yes. tapped into that, I said, I don't, I said, I'll pay whatever we've already done and all the fees. I, I, will, I will pay this. I'm not trying to, to not do right by you. So please know I'm not that. I, I just, I can't do this. He said, why? I said, well, you're Nigerian. You understand this? God says no. He goes, oh, you're one of those. I said, yes, I am one of those. <laughs> he, was a, he was a Nigerian that had come over and got into medical school and all that. And he was a real nice guy. I said, most Nigerians, if they're not saying they have a God awareness. Yeah. You know. He says, oh, you're one of those. I said, yes, but mine works. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a flaky guy. I, he goes, well, sir, if, if you need to come back, please do. But you and God have a, have a good day. And, and, he, and he thought, and I got up and put my clothes on, and as I walked out of the office, the pain left and never came back. Thank you, Lord. So I've had no Thank you, Lord. So sometimes full gospel people take healing to a point where they don't know how to put prayer and medicine together. I want us as a new generation of spiritual people to let God's statement be the final statement, but we're not rude to the other people. There's a way to... Embrace them, and also, like you heard, I embraced it the first time. That was right. The second time, no, and I got my miracle that way. Now I don't know why it wasn't like that the first time, yeah. but I'm just glad I'm okay. Amen. 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 Does that help anybody Amen. today? Yes. So yes. we don't want anybody to do that. And spirit-filled people, oh, hurry, 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 stop. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. Spirit-filled right. people, we believe you can all hear God for yourself. Amen. We, we believe that you're, we teach you to, to rightly divide the word of truth and to hear the voice of God correctly. Yeah. So you can hear God for yourself. We don't need to inquire of the prophet. Mm -hmm. The prophetic ministry today is more confirmation than anything. Praise yeah. God for confirmation. Yep. Yeah. Not put the prophetic ministry down. Right. Love it. Embrace it. Like everything about even the music. Ooh, yes. I like all that music. <laughs> you know, prophetic music is always like in outer space. Yeah. <laughs> 
I like all that stuff. But we want that to stay in this right place. And we want you to hear God for yourself. We want your children to learn how to hear God correctly so they can be in any circumstance and find an answer they don't know of what to do. So we do not want a dependency upon the pastor or the leadership. We want to grow you up where you don't need us anymore. Right. The job of every pastor is to work himself or herself out of the job. That's right. Yes. That's right. The day my church don't need to call me for counsel or call me for help is a good day. Amen. Well, what are they going to do? I'll get a new bunch and start over and let them go do something else. Yeah. Let them go build churches, go help the other churches or yeah. do whatever. That's right. So I don't want them to stay babies. Another one. Next one. We believe in the local church. Yes. The spirit-filled per- people believe in the local church. Thank you, Lord. Jesus is building the church. Yes. Now I realize some churches should close right. because the candlestick has been blown out. Amen. Amen. Come on. Yes. Come on. All right. Amen. But we're not anti-church. I also realize some churches are so boring the devil don't even come. <laughs> I've been going to church my whole life, so I I get it. But if you'll come in and take the song that's being sung. And you put your faith and put your passion in it, it'll create a better environment. Yeah, sure. Amen? Yes. And uh, we, we believe in the five-fold ministry, and I need to close here. And I'd also say this, just as a last remark, we believe in women ministers. Hallelujah. And we believe that women can do anything a man can do if God told them to do it. Yes. And so if I was a woman that believed in, she was called to be a, the five-fold ministers, I'd join a full gospel church. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Because there are Amen. more acceptance in this particular expression of Christianity than in yes. all the others. Right. In some of the other churches, you can do ladies' meetings or do missionary meetings, but you can't be an apostle, you can't be a prophet, you can't right. be a pastor. But yeah. in, we believe that in the kingdom of God, there's not male or female. Yeah. Amen. Yes. Yep. There's heart condition Thank and Jesus. call. Yes. Thank you. And so if you will do what is right, we want to empower every person to obey their personal calling, That's right. and their corporate place in the body. Yes. Yes. You can do both. Some of you think, oh, i got to take care of my ministry. You can take care of your ministry and be a part of a local church yes. and do your part. I, I've done that my whole life. Now, I'm a traveler, and when I'm not building a church, I'm in one. And I participate. When I moved to Sarasota, uh, I joined the Harvest Tabernacle, Jim and Peggy Miner over there. It's a really great church. And um, I became an usher. Because I can usher when I'm in town. And you don't, if I'm gone, you don't miss me that much. <laughs> if I'm a Sunday school teacher or I'm one of the other type of daily weekly things, I can't do that because I'm not there enough to be faithful and to keep right. stability yes. with the right. church. So I always try to pick things that I can do as a in and out guy because of my job of being a preacher. I'm usually preaching on most Sundays. And when I'm there midweek, I can go usher. I can be a counselor in the altar. I can come up. And do that. So I go through their classes. And it freaks out the pastors. Usually that, what are you doing? I'm learning how you do what you do in your church so I can participate in it. Wow. Wow. And I want to encourage you that you all have busy lives. And you're thinking, but could you make some time to help your local church? Find something that you can do. And maybe it's only once a month. Maybe it's twice a month. Maybe, I don't know what it is that you, you can do to help. Uh, do something for Jesus and do participate and be a part of the stability and the growth and the health of your church. And, uh, and and not just attend and smile and, and leave, but do something, you know. And a, don't take on a thing that's going to be a burden to you at this time in your life. Yep. Do something that you can do with joy and you can be consistent and faithful about your commitment so the church has stability. Some churches are not stable because the people committing don't know how to commit. They commit to things they can't do or really don't want to do. Or, you know, they don't work it out where they can be consistent. So a lot of the stability of the local church is up to the family that's there. Yeah. You, know, you know, I don't feel called the children's ministry. But if you have children, you know how to help children. You can learn how to do children's ministry once a month or once every two months. There's things you can do that uh, out of your little comfort zone and, and be able to be a part of the body and help your local church. And your local church doesn't have to be the famous church or the biggest church. It has to be right for you. And your family. Amen. That feeds you, challenges you, and you build community yes. and friendships there. Amen. 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 You all enjoy the message? Excellent. Yes. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Well, I want to thank Pastor for
having me and uh, Jason for making the connection yeah. for me. And I hope I get to see you all again. Oh, yes. Yes. And uh, I guess it's 12.45, it's time for lunch. We've fed oh. our spirit, now it's time to feed our flesh. <laughs> yeah. Yes. One yes. The rest of you Hallelujah. We all want to fast now for Jesus. <laughs> yes. All right, let me pray for you, all right? Father, we thank you today for this beautiful church and this wonderful atmosphere of believers that have gathered here. We bless the pastors and the leaders yeah. under him. Yes. Yes. May you strengthen them, give them creative ideas, enhance them, and give them money and work and what they need to do what they're called to do here and in this community. Amen. We ask for provision on all levels yes. to come. I pray for you to be healed in your body, Thank you, Lord. stable in your mind, Thank you, joyful in your emotions. Yes. I pray for your spirit to stand up and be strong. And I pray the wrong people get out of your life. Yes. Yes. The wrong people get out of your children's lives and your yes. grandchildren's yes. lives. Yes. And yes. I ask God to put the right people yes. in your life, your children and grandchildren's life, where you can do life together and have a good time living and growing and serving. Father, give us social miracles and deliverances in our life. Yes. And I pray that God will prosper you. He'll honor your giving and your tithing. He'll honor your other seeds that you've given throughout your life and through time and other things you've done. Yes, Father, you promised that whatever we give, you'd receive and you would send a harvest of 30, 60, and 100. Yes. Father, we thank you for that. Yes. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you help the harvest come into their hand. Yes. Yes. And